Welcome to the video key for quiz three. So in the first question we're looking at trends in charge density, a trends driven by charge density in these various thermodynamic properties. So a good idea would be to change each of these deltas into a process just so we can remind ourselves what that process is. I'll just draw that as a little triangle up here at the, at the top. So if we imagine we have a salt, and it's solid, we can imagine taking that salt and blowing it apart into ions in the gas phase. And that is our delta lattice. Okay, so that's that process. So whether we're talking about delta H, G, or S, the process of going from solid salt into ions is the lattice change. If we imagine taking those ions and plunging them down so that they become hydrated as aqueous ions, we're going to call that delta hydration. Okay, so that's the change, that's the process, and then we can look at the various thermodynamic properties for that change. And of course, if we were to just go straight across or add the top arrows, we would get the overall solution process. Okay, so when we dissolve salts in water, we can conceptually break it down into those two steps. Um, so let's look at the analysis here. We're looking at, um, for the top two, entropy. So first, hydration enthalpy, entropy. So we're imagining we're going down from ions that are free to fly around in the gas phase to being in the water. And we know their movement's going to be less when they're in the aqueous phase, so we expect their entropy to going to go down. In addition, we know that waters are going to be oriented around ions. So for instance, we, if we draw water molecules like this, we know their negative ends would be pointed towards the cation and we could draw the reverse picture for anions. And let's just go ahead and do it. We have an anion. The sodiums are going to be pointing towards the water rather than the uh, the hydrogens are going to be pointed towards the towards the ions rather than the uh, oxygens. Okay, so the dipoles of the molecules are lined up so that here we have positive with negative, and over here we have the negative end of this dipole. The, with the positive ion. So we're going to orient those waters. That's going to decrease its entropy. So we know this is going to go down. Okay. Um, and what happens if you increase the charge density? Okay. If I increase the charge density, that's going to make this effect bigger. The bigger the charge, so maybe if I go to a, to a plus two, or perhaps if I um, there's two ways to increase charge density. I could take an ion like this, and I could imagine going to an ion that is um, the same size, roughly the same size. That would be an increase in charge density, right? I could also take an ion and replace it with one that's the same charge but smaller, okay, but with the same charge that's going to be increase in charge density. So um, increasing charge density would be either one of these processes, okay? Going from a sodium to a calcium, say, or going from a potassium to a lithium, going from a big ion to a small one. Okay, so either one of those would be an increasing charge density. And um, as we said, the entropy change for this first thing we're analyzing um, is going to be negative Right? We're going to decrease the entropy of the ions partly because of this water orientation effect, and that effect's going to get bigger and bigger as we make the ion more and more charged. So um, we're going to have a trend here towards more and more negative uh, entropy changes if we increase the charge density. What about the lattice entropy? Well, we're going to have ions stuck in a lattice to ions flying around, and that's not going to be affected by um, how charged the ions are. Right? They're stuck in the lattice in the solid. They're not stuck in the lattice in the gas phase. So that's, there's no, no, no trend here. So let's put a little line here. Okay, now we're going to go to energy. Okay, what about 
um, the enthalpy, the delta H of lattice. Well, we have to put energy in to break this lattice apart to make the ion. So this is the endothermic process. Delta H is positive. What happens to how positive it is if we increase the charge density? Well, the more charged the ions are, the harder it is to break apart this lattice. Okay, so this is going to go up if we increase if we increase the charge on the ions or if we make them smaller. So remember, it's center to center distance that matters when we look at ion attractions. And so the smaller the ions are, the, the smaller the center is, the smaller the, the distance is. And so um, if you look at a salt like lithium fluoride, it's going to have a bigger lattice enthalpy than a salt like cesium iodide or something where you've got really big atoms. Push the atoms apart by making them big, they have a weaker attraction. Okay, so higher charge density, bigger, more positive lattice enthalpy. Okay, what about delta H of solution? Um, actually, we'll leave that to last because we need this bottom piece first. So let's do the let's do the hydration. So hydration, that's this process over here. Okay, so we're looking at this process and um, we're going from ions in the gas phase to ions in the in the water. And we know this is a process that's gonna give off energy because we're not breaking any bonds. The ions here are not bound to anything. When we come down here, they're gonna be bound to water in these ion-dipole interactions. Just write ion-dipole down here. Just to emphasize that that's the interaction that we're talking about in water. So we're building interactions, right? Making bonds, in this case, are IMFs, is going to give off energy. So we know this is a negative uh, delta H. What happens to the value of that delta H um, as, uh, um, um, actually we should, we should clarify here because what this arrow means, so I'm going to, I'm going to see, I'm going to write over here that this one I'm going to say gets more negative. Okay, so I don't, mind, I don't want to say down because I don't mean that the size gets down. I mean it gets more negative. That's what that arrow meant here. So for the one we're working on now, we agree that this is also a negative number, the, the um, enthalpy of hydration. What happens to the size of that negative number as we, um, as we increase charge density? Well, we're building interactions that are getting stronger if we, if we put more charge on the ion, right? So that's going to get more negative as we as we increase charge density. So there's a trend for A and for E, but the trend is to become more negative. Okay, um, and uh, let's go ahead and do and see if there's any other ones we can find trends for. Um, what about the heat of solution D? So for D, notice that D, or, or uh, process D here, the heat, the heat of solution, is this process here. It's a sum of lattice and hydration. So if we combine C and E, we can try to figure out D, okay? So we saw that the lattice enthalpy is gonna get more positive if we increase charge density the hydration enthalpy is going to get more negative if we increase charge density. Well, if one gets more positive and one gets more negative, do we know if there's a trend here? No, we don't. There's not a clear predictable trend here uh, because we're making, we're adding a positive and a negative number and we're making them both bigger. So we really can't say if there's a trend in the heat of solution. So I'm going to put a line here. Okay, so looking at this, the question is, um, which thermodynamic parameters have a trend of increasing magnitude? Um, we have one that gets more positive. I'm going to put that right here. And we have two that get more negative, one here and, and one here. Right? So we have three where there's a clear trend. And the question said, which thermodynamic parameters have a trend of increasing magnitude, the absolute value? So we don't care. Um, we don't care if it's getting more positive, more negative, just like increasing size. Okay. 
So we have one here where it's getting more negative. It was negative to begin with, and it's getting more and more negative for increased charge density. This one was positive, and it's getting more positive. And then this one, E, is negative and is getting more negative. So on those three, there is a trend of increasing or increasing magnitude, increasing absolute value with charge density. So that was quite a long problem with a lot of thoughts. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, this is one we're, we're analyzing the solubility in water. Okay, so what we're looking for, remember we wanna match the IMFs of the solvent to the, um, uh, to the the IMFs of the thing we're trying to dissolve in it. If they match well, then it's gonna to tend to dissolve. So if we look at the IMFs that we could form uh, between water, so water in itself, if we write water and water, two water molecules, we know that we can have London dispersion interaction. And we've also got dipole dipole. And we're also going to have dipole induced dipole. And uh, between two water molecules, we're also going to have H bonding. So the whole the whole list. Okay, so the question is what happens when you link this up with propylamine? So we look at propylamine. Uh, of course, we always have London dispersion interaction. We look at this, we can see we've got a dipole here. So we're gonna have, we've got, um, basically the nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon and hydrogen. So we're gonna have a dipole pointing towards the nitrogen. And uh, if we look at this, this is, this is a tetrahedral um, nitrogen. So uh, we expect to see a, a dipole there. And uh, what about, so it's dipole, dipole, dipole induced dipole. And so if we put this next to a water molecule, and we can see we're also gonna have hydrogen bonding because we have a hydrogen bond acceptor, uh, a donor atom here and a hydrogen bond acceptor atom there. So we have um, everything we need for hydrogen bonding, uh, certainly with itself, but also uh, with water. So totally compatible with water. And if we look at the propane nitrile, once again, London dispersion interaction. Um, this is a polar molecule because we're gonna have a dipole in that direction there. So dipole, dipole, dipole induced dipole. Okay, so what about hydrogen bonding? If we look at this nitrogen, we see that it's got um, uh, the ability to have a, it's got a um, hydrogen bond uh, acceptor atom. It doesn't have any hydrogen bond donors. And if we look at this, we've got hydrogen bond acceptor and then two hydrogen bond donor atoms. So this has like three different ways to get hydrogen bond with water. This has one. And so uh, we, we think ah, this is not gonna be quite as good. If we look at them in terms of carbon atoms, one, two, three carbon atoms, one, two, three carbon atoms. So the, the nonpolar part of the molecule is, is the same. So we would predict that the one that's more soluble in water would be the propylamine. And that's actually true. It's more soluble in water than propane nitrile. Okay, number three. So we've got four aqueous solutions and they're the same concentration. One of them has the lowest melting point. So in this case, we know that the melting point depression is given by, uh, basically it's a function of the concentration. We can write that, I'll just write it as a curvy M to remind you that we use molality here. And the freezing point depression curve uh, constant, the cryoscopic constant K, but also this this Van Hoff factor, which is um, uh, ideal in the ideal solution theory. It's the number of particles produced when something dissolves uh, for per formula unit. So if we look at the I factors here, let's just write them in. Calcium bromide is three. Methanol is a molecule, so it's one. Acetic acid is a weak acid. It's mostly intact. If it were totally intact, it would be one. If it dissociated completely, it would be two. So it's, we'll just say it's approximately 1.0, uh, you know, 
I don't know, 1.01. This is this is just we're just guessing here. It's going to be something slightly more than one. Definitely less than two. So maybe to be more accurate to say that it is um, uh, more than one and um, much much less than. Um, actually, this is written backwards here. Here, let's try this again. X is going to be much less than two, and it's going to be greater than one. Okay, so it's it's some number close to one. Um, it's not legible, so let's just write that over here. Okay, it's going to be slightly greater than one, a lot less than two. All right. Anyway, sodium chloride has a sodium ion and a chloride ion, and um, I didn't write the calcium bromide out and why it is what it is, but since calcium plus two and bromide is minus one, we can see we have three particles when um, per Fermi unit when it when it breaks up. Um, and then yeah, so the question is, is there enough data? There is. We know that acetic acid is less than two, sodium chloride is two, methanol is only one, so it has to be calcium bromide. All right, a reaction is exothermic. Negative value for delta S. What about delta G standard? So these are all standards. So let's just write out delta G standard equal delta H standard minus T delta S standard. We said that we a negative change in entropy, but also that it's exothermic. So we know this is negative as well. So um, we can see that this whole term, which I'll bubble around this term, we can see this whole term is going to be positive, right? Because that negative sign in the temperature. So if we want to ensure that delta G is negative, we've got to uh, make sure this term's not too big. So this would be at low temperature. All right, remember, we're always going to use absolute temperature here, so the T itself is always a positive number. All right, propanol versus glycerol. Which one would be more soluble in heptane? And notice we're talking about propanol. Um, that suffix means that it's an aldehyde. So, um, uh, as you can see from the structure, so which would be more soluble in heptane? So heptane is just, you know, it's just, you can see there's, it's a hydrocarbon. You can see that just from the formula. You don't even need the structure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, uh, we can see it's a hydrocarbon from the, from the formula. Uh, not gonna be polar. So we want something nonpolar. And if we look at the the uh, IMFs on the two compounds, we can see this, I'll just say all IMFs, right? We can see it's like water, it's got hydrogen bond donors, acceptors, it's polar, it's, it's got everything. If we look at this one, we can see there's gonna be a dipole moment, um, and we can see that when this is uh, by itself, it can't hydrogen bond, right? So by itself, it has no hydrogen bonding because it has a hydrogen bond uh, acceptor atom, but no hydrogen bond donors. So this is going to be all IMF except. H bonding. So if we try to dissolve glycerol in heptane, Glycerol molecule can hydrogen bond with itself, with, with other molecules, um, but it can't do that with, with heptane, so it's gonna have to give that up if it dissolves in heptane. Whereas uh, propanol does not have the same problem. So for that reason, it more closely matches the IMFs in propanol, because if we look at if we look at propanol, I'll just do one over here, it's London dispersion only. London dispersion interaction only. Um, so this is really weak IMFs. We want to match it to something weak IMFs in. The weaker of the two is going to be propanol. So it's going to be the one that's more soluble in in uh, in heptane. So we're going to say propanol. All right. Uh, another ice problem. Okay. So best way to do these is to is to do a Q versus T ter, uh, graph here. And first, we'll sort of just sketch out the general plot. The general plot would be if we have really cold ice, we've got to melt it, and we've got to, we've got to heat it up to the melting point. 
and then we've got to melt it and then we've got to heat up the water and then we've got to boil the water and then we've got to heat up the water vapor. So those are all possible ways of putting heat into something. Um, so we'll just put here solid, liquid, gas, and then we'll put boil and melt here. Just to label all these segments. All right, and now we say, where did we start? Okay, well, we started off with ice at negative 10. So we're, we're down here, right? We're down below the melting point of ice. So we're, if, as soon as we put heat to that ice, the ice is gonna heat up without melting, not at first. So we're gonna go up this way. All right, well, if we do that, we're gonna need the heat, heat of the heat capacity for ice. So the specific heat of ice, we're gonna, we're gonna need that. We've got water vapor at 100 degrees C. So we've got water vapor, but where are we on this, on this curve? We're at the very bottom already, right? We've already, we're already at the temperature where if we take any heat out of that water vapor, it's gonna condense. So notice, um, since these are different temperatures, we are gonna do a heat transfer between the two pieces of the system. So this is gonna start, um, this is gonna start condensing. It's going the opposite way. It's not boiling, it's condensing. Uh, so we need the heat of vaporization. But notice we're never going to have to change the temperature of the water vapor, right? We're already at the lowest temperature water vapor can be. So we do not need the specific heat of water vapor. Okay. And notice, though, we don't know where these two errors are going to meet, but they're going to meet somewhere, right? So whether they meet and where they meet is going to depend on the relative masses of the two parts of the system. But regardless of where you meet, you can see that you're going to have to traverse these segments, right? So you depending on the relative amounts, you could have ended up anywhere along this path um, as the final temperature, but to figure that out, you're gonna need constants from everywhere along the path. So we need the specific heat of water, and we also need the heat of fusion, right? Because we, we need to know, are we gonna start freezing some of that former water vapor, or are we gonna melt all the ice we had? Depends on the relative amount, but we will need the heat of fusion. So we put that on there. So with that said, the only thing we're not going to need is the specific heat of water vapor because we're already at the lowest temperature water vapor can be. We can't cool it off anymore. As soon as we pull heat out, it's going to, it's going to go into, um, into condensation rather than, um, rather than uh, cooling off the water vapor. All right, so it's going to be all four of those. OK, last two questions. We're going this problem. This problem was the most missed problem on the quiz. Uh, uh, it was quite difficult for the class. So um, it's probably worthwhile to, uh, to go through this solution, uh, especially, especially if, you, if you miss this question. So the biggest problem here is, is I, I think it's basically forgetting the definition of molarity versus molality. So let's write what molality is. It's supposed to be an M here. moles of solute over kilograms of sol vent okay versus molarity is equal to moles of solute again, but this time not only is it liters, that's the only that's not the only change, it's liters of solution. So this is I'm gonna underline solvent versus solution. Like totally different, right? It's everything that's in the solution versus just the solvent. And that critical difference was the one that was missed. So there was a specific error, and it was that specific error that was the most common mistake on the on the quiz. So let's, let's go through this. So we want to get, we start off with molality. So we're over here. We need to somehow work our way over here. Well, the moles of solute, like that part is easy, right? We can imagine that we have um, one kilogram of solution. And if we do that, we're going to have 4.5 moles. Um, but the bottom part's the part that's tricky. So let's write this out. We've got 4.5 moles of potassium bromide 
over one kilogram of potassium bromide. Uh, sorry, of one kilogram of, of the solvent, which is water. It's uh, um, okay. So let's let's assume. Well, that's right. I'll, I'll just be I'll just be generic and say solvent. Um, I can tell from the density it's it's probably water, but that's that we don't actually don't need to know that. So it's a kilogram of solvent. So we need to somehow get replace the kilogram of solvent with how many liters of solution that is. So notice what we're going to do is we don't want to convert this from from what people try to do is convert this using the density, but you can't do that because that's that's a kilogram of solvent, and this is the density of the solution. We don't have the density of the solvent, and we, and we don't need it. So we've got to figure out the mass of solution first that goes with a kilogram of solvent, and then we'll be able to use that density. Okay, so the key here is the solution has two pieces. It has the solvent and the solution. So those two pieces have to sum uh, the solvent and the, the solute, and that has to, to sum to the solution. So what we're going to do is figure out how much this bromine this, this uh, uh, potassium bromide weighs, and then we're gonna add it to that to get the total mass. So we're gonna stop here and just have a little interlude where we say, okay, if I had 4.5 moles of potassium bromide, I could figure out how much that weighed. So you use a periodic table and you get 119 grams of potassium bromide is going to be one mole uh, potassium bromide. Okay, so that comes out to 536 grams of our potassium bromide. And so at this point, we've got grams of potassium bromide, but we also had the grams of our solvent, or at least kilograms. We had, right, we had um, one kilogram of our solvent. Let me make sure that looks like a G there. There we go. So the total mass, the mass of solution, is equal to our 536 grams of potassium bromide plus our 1,000 grams of solvent. And so that comes up to 1,536 grams of solution. And at this point, now we can use our density, right? So we've got 1,536 grams of solution. And this is why I want you to write your units out with labels, like grams of solution, not just grams, right? Because this way, you can avoid that mistake because when you go to do your density, you can see the density, it's the density of the solution, right? So we've got 100 or sorry, 1.26 grams of solution is going to be one mil of solution. And we can cancel grams, cancel grams of solution with grams of solution, right? So now we're, now we're doing, we're applying the density to the right thing, right? To the to the solution, not just to the solvent. And so uh, that comes out to be uh, with the density taken into account, 1.22. Um, let's put this in grams, um, uh, uh, in mils rather. So we can put it in mils. We're going to need it in liters. Let's convert to liters. 1.22 liters. So we've got our volume that we need for our molarity, right? We already had the moles of solute, now we have the liters of solution. And to emphasize that's the volume of solution, not the, not the volume of solvent, okay? And at this point, we can now calculate the concentration and molarity. We can say that we've got, um, we can say concentration is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume. So we have uh, 4.5 moles of potassium bromide over 1.22 liters. And so that's going to give us 3.69 moles per liter. Or we could just write it as 3.69 
molarity, 3.69 molar. Okay. All right. Uh, in the B version um, of the quiz, the answer is equal to 4.6 molar. Okay. All right, let's go down to number eight. Number eight's a lot simpler. Uh, any delta is final minus initial, so it's going to be, uh, you can think of the products as being final and the reactants being initial in this process. So the delta S of reaction is going to be the sum of the entropies of the products minus the sum of the entropies of the reactants. And when you do that, you do have to take into account these coefficients, right? Because you're making three moles of water, not one. And the same thing with the oxygen. Also notice that these entropies are not delta entropies. They're not entropies of formation. They're just the actual entropy of the compound. And for that reason, they're not zero for elements. So uh, let's go ahead and put this in. We can see that delta S for this specific reaction is going to be, we're going to have uh, three moles of water. And entropy varies by physical state. So in this case, we want liquid water. We want the entropy of the dinitrogen tetroxide in the gas phase. And then we want to subtract uh, 3.5 moles of oxygen and two moles, oops, I need the entropy in there, and two moles, of, or two twice the, the uh, entropy of ammonia. And be careful, ammonia is in two different physical states in your equation sheet. In this case, we wanted the gas phase. And their, their thermodynamic properties are totally different because this one's not interacting with water. So we have three times 69.9 joules per mole per Kelvin. We've got 304 for a dinitrogen tetroxide. Uh, we have seven halves times 205 for oxygen. And for our nitrogen gas, it is 192. So if we all add all that up, we get, wait, you know what? Before we do this, we should predict the sign. So we look at this and we can see we've got 3.5 moles of gas uh, plus two moles. And on the right hand side, we've got one mole of gas. Okay, so without doing any math, we can see we're losing a lot of moles of gas. So um, because the moles of gas have gone down, we expect this delta to be negative. And indeed, when we do the math, we can see that we lose a lot of entropy, negative 588 joules per mole per Kelvin. And that's it for the video key for quiz three. Thank you for watching.